so in this new book, you and uh, your colleague Jeremy Freeman, you've uh, collected a series of essays from some of the world's leading neuroscientists. Two of them just got the Nobel Prize in Medicine. It's always nice when the Nobel Committee kind of endorses your book. You know, just um, before the book went to press, they won the uh, Nobel Prize. It was fabulous. Well, that's great. Um, I wanted to know, what was the process behind gathering this uh, collection? How did you decide what to include, what not to include? Well, the editor actually originally, the editor for Princeton Press, who actually has since left, came to me and wanted me to write a, a book just m by myself. And I thought, there's so many interesting things going on in neuroscience right now, and I'm not expert in all of them. Why don't I get the experts to do it? So, you know, Tom Sawyer whitewashing the fence, I got the other people to, to do a lot of the work. I, I helped along the way. Um, but. And it was fairly obvious what the overall organization should be. I mean, there's a whole lot of work right now on atlases of the brain, basically. And, you know, we have a section on that. I wanted a section on critics. You know, some people think this is an easier job than others. I wanted um, there to be people talking about the ethics of it. Um, I think the, the most fun part, in a way, um, is the afterward and the end, where we project it out into the future. Maybe we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, I think the organization was relatively clear. And then the subtitle, which you know, we, I think we thought of kind of from day one, pretty much told us where to go, right? Essays by the world's leading neuroscientists. So we went around to the world's leading neuroscientists. Yeah, and um, you know, I started with Christoph Koch, who I know very well. And he was really excited. And then I was able to say, well, Christoph is in. Are you in, too? And, and most of the people that we asked said yes. And not, not quite everybody that we asked said yes. You know, some people had like book deadlines or whatever and couldn't do it. But, but you know, seventy percent probably of the people that we asked said yes. I and mean, people were excited. Everybody feels this moment that this is a special moment. Um, I think we all think that the book might influence like how money is spent. Like, I mean, this is a moment where Congress is deciding should we go into neuroscience. I gave a copy to Chaka Fatah, who is the person in Congress who's most directly um, pushing neuroscience forward, and he read it and he tweeted about it and he talked about it and um, so. You know, I, I think we were right to think that this book could play a role in, in um, how the, that conversation goes forward. And I think um, because of who the people are and, and because they're kind of all gathered in one place, it really is the best book right now if someone wants to get a capsule of where are we in neuroscience, why are we excited, why are we a little bit concerned still, and so forth. I think you know, this, this book is the state of the art, so it's a very exciting book. Yeah, it is a very rich collection. Um, so people used to say that brain is like a computer, but then they realize that no, the brain is much more complicated than our most sophisticated machines. And they kind of, nobody talks about the brain as if it was a computer anymore, but Except you, <laughs> but you argue that we should return to that idea, sort that's, of. That's right. I'm fighting a rear guard action. I'm saying that that we've given up on it too soon. Now, obviously, the brain doesn't work exactly like you know the the Commodore 64 that I learned about when I was you know a child computer programmer. But there are things that are about computation that are really important. So, I mean, fundamentally, computation is about information processing. You have a set of inputs, you have some recipe, and you have some set of outputs. That's what computer programs are. Well, we don't have stored programs. You can't download an app into your brain. I mean, there was this scene in The Matrix where I forget the actress's name uh, or the character's name downloads um, the ability to to pilot a helicopter, and we're a long way from being able to do that. We don't un understand enough about how the brains and coding systems work, and the brain itself doesn't really traffic in programs per se, but it does traffic in information processing, and. There's a logic to what it does, and I think if we understand that logic, we're going to better understand uh, what the brain does. I have an article in Science a few weeks ago um, with Adam Marblestone and, and, and Tom Dean where we talk about something called an FPGA, which is a particular kind of a computer. Um, I'll say something about that in a second, but even if you don't know what that is, you might have heard of a GPU, so mm -hmm. graphics processing unit, which are, are ubiquitous now. So all, all modern computers have GPUs. Your, your cell phone has a GPU. And they do computation in a very different way than traditional computing. So instead of doing everything one step at a time, they do things across, let's say, a whole image at once. Every pixel in the image might get brightened or darkened or um, otherwise changed. Every Photoshop filter is, is, is run on a GPU or can be run on a GPU. Um, and FPGA is kind of a similar concept where you can have computation in parallel doing a whole bunch of things at once rather than just step by step I'm going to follow this, this algorithm. And that opens up new vistas in terms of what computation might be. In an FPGA, it's called a field programmable gate array. The idea is you have 
a uniform architecture on the surface, but you can customize different pieces of it to do different computations. It turns out to be tremendously useful. And we argue that the brain is at least a little bit like this. I mean, we're not saying it's literally an FPGA, and you know, there are a lot of technical details there that we don't really care about. But this idea that what you're doing is you have different parts of the brain doing different computations um, in parallel, integrated in some interesting way, I think, I think is on the right track. I think more on the right track than the alternative, which is a lot of people have been talking about, which is kind of there's one uniform architecture. So people say, oh, the cortex, it looks you know, kind of similar from front to back. But I think that's like at one level of resolution, it looks pretty similar from front to back. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a lot of fine-grained detail at the synapse okay. level that really makes different brain circuits do different kinds of computations. Um, well, I know you're one of the skeptics. But do you think that we will ever be able to um, make truly intelligent robots? Truly intelligent robots. Um, sure, I don't see any principled reason why we can't. Um, if the only way we could do it would be by simulating the human brain literally, like molecule by molecule, I'd say we're in trouble because the amount of time to run a simulation that required that level of detail might be too much. It might run a thousand times more slowly than a person, and if it does, then I mean, you don't want a robot that moves around like this. And in fact, actually, if you watch the current robots, like there are these great videos of them folding towels, and if you read carefully, they're sped up by a hundred times. The right way to do that is to learn something abstract about how the brain works. We don't want to model it neuron by neuron. We want to understand it neuron by neuron, but then we want to, to abstract and, and, and build something new. Eventually, we'll be able to do that. I mean, we're a long way right now from, from a robot that you would trust in the home or something like that. I mean, you don't want your, your robot to put your cat in the dishwasher, right? So you know, it's one thing if Google translates like 80% correct, but it's another thing if your home robot were 80% correct. That would be really dangerous. <laughs> so we're a long way from there, but I don't see a principal reason why we can't it. I mean, human intelligence is, you know, it's carbon instead of silicon, but it's, it's a machine that does a lot of pretty powerful things. Not perfectly, but um, I don't see any principled reason why we can't do it. I'm a little bit pessimistic about the current state of um, artificial intelligence. I mean, I think there's been a lot of progress, but there's like a lot of trees and not enough forest right now. People make things that are very focused on particular problems and they don't, they, there's not enough integration between different communities like people working on planning and language and vision and, and so, so forth. So robots or machines that are good at one thing, but... The, well, mostly we have AI programs that are good at one thing. We, robots, I mean, if they're good at one thing, it's like cleaning Walking. your floor and they're not really even that good at that. Um, you know, Google Translate is really good at what it does. It's not human level translation, but you know, for something that's free, it's great. Um, but there isn't really an analog in robots. I mean, I guess you could say like Big Dog is a pretty good military robot, but it requires this, you know, big hydraulic contraption and stuff like that. So even there, it's not that practical. There aren't that many practical robots yet. There will be soon, um, mm -hmm. but there aren't yet. Well, I gotta say the the part that I enjoyed the most in the book was your imaginary time traveler from the year 2064. That's right. It was an, an homage to Stanislaw Lem, who wrote these great old books about, um, like he had one book that was all prefaces to imaginary books, and another one that was book reviews to imaginary books. Um, so we, Christoph Koch and I wrote this chapter together, and we report a traveler from the future who sort of tells us how the last 50 years of neuroscience have gone, and we, 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 we give his vision of what neuroscience is like in 2064. So every Everything else in the book is like straight science. This is what I'm doing in my lab. This is why it's exciting. This is why it's you know harder than it looks. Um, and then in that that epilogue, we, we really kind of we gave ourselves a free pass to be, to be a little bit less um, you know buttoned up, a little bit more imaginative. And we talk about questions like you know will we really have a whole brain emulation 50 years from now? If we do, what will it mean? Will people agree about what it does? So it was really fun writing that. And it's going to be probably very amusing for people from actual 2064 to read that and see. Exactly. Actually, we say in the preface, um, and this really came from something a reviewer of the book said that I thought was great, which is um, that, you know, this is this is a time capsule. This is like what it's like in 2014 or 2015. Um, you know, what's the state of neuroscience? And we've got all these predictions. It'll be really fun to open up that time capsule in you know, 50 years and say, were they right about anything? Were they completely wrong? And so it's, it's fun to like commit it to paper and see how it goes. Well, I hope you all will be right. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Gary, for coming here. Thanks very much for having me.